Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. And I do realize that by reading my books, listening to my lectures, even listening to the Mindscape Podcast, you can get an impression of quantum mechanics and in modern physics more generally that is a little way out, right? We're talking about uh, parallel universes or quantum gravity, emergent space-time, evaporating black holes. It may seem a little bit removed from the nitty-gritty of not just experimental physics, but also of your everyday experience. But of course, quantum mechanics itself was not invented by theoretical physicists just trying to think of cool things things. They were forced to come up with these crazy ideas by trying to explain the data, by trying to explain experiments. And these experiments have not stopped. They've not gone away. And I'm not talking about experiments that use quantum mechanics. Those experiments have also been going on a long time. Every particle physics experiment, like the Large Hadron Collider, uses quantum mechanics to make the predictions. I'm talking about a new generation of quantum mechanics experiments that really digs into entanglement. Quantum entanglement is really one of the things that is special about quantum mechanics, makes it very different from the classical world. The idea that different physical systems can be related related to each other in some deep quantum way. What can we do with that? We can build quantum computers. We can do other things as well. So today's guest, Monica Schleier-Smith, is an experimental physicist who works on cold atoms. And the reason why cold atoms are really interesting is because when they're cold, you can entangle them and you can control the amount of entanglement. You can shoot little photons at them and you can sort of manipulate them in a very, very delicate way. So ordinary atoms that are hot or just bumping into each other randomly, they will become entangled, but then unentangled and you don't know and you can't really control it. When you really cool them down, you have this pinpoint precision control. So you can do a lot of different things. You can do sort of down-to-earth things, which I think was the original motivation, metrology, uh, measuring things to exquisite precision. But then guess what? The crazy theorists have come in and ruined everything by pointing out you can also build models of quantum gravity. And this is one of the things that Monica does. She, in her lab at Stanford, builds uh, groups of atoms that are entangled with each other in the right way that, well, it's just beginning. I wouldn't say that we're there yet, but it's resembling uh, the features of a model of holographic duality, the famous ADS-CFT conjecture that Juan Maldacena put forward you know, almost 25 years ago now, where you can have a theory without gravity and a theory with gravity, and secretly they're the same. Likewise, Monica can build collections of entangled atoms that if you look at them in exactly the right way, resemble a system with gravity. And then you can use what you know about gravity to make predictions about what those atoms are going to do. It's still beginning stuff, very, very cutting edge, but the hope is we'll both just learn more about quantum mechanics and how to manipulate entanglement and collections of atoms, but maybe also learn a little bit about how gravity and space-time do emerge from these collections of atoms. So the real lesson here is that there's no real clear, sharp distinction between the down-to-earth useful applications of quantum mechanics and the pie-in-the-sky theorizing that me and my friends like to do so much. So let's go. Monica Flyer Smith, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thanks for having me. So I want to start with a slightly left field question because you're an experimental physicist. I'm a theoretical physicist. Uh, in certain circles, there's a feeling that theorists kind of grab, grab all the glory. They hog all the credit, you know, like experimentalists are in there doing the hard work. Most physicists are experimenters, many more than theorists. Uh, but it's the theorists who end up writing the books and being on TV and things like that. Is, is this a feeling that you either have or get uh, in your everyday work or or are is in your world it's it's happy collaborations uh, all around yeah um that is actually not a feeling i've gotten i do remember one of my college professors saying everybody comes into college thinking they want to be a theoretical physicist and <laughs> nobody thinks to do experiments and you know there's something to the idea of doing experiments um but no often um you know i often tell my students one of the things i love about being an experimentalist is if i have an idea I don't need to convince, and it's an idea that 
merits experimentation. I don't need to convince somebody else to do the experiment. Um, you can just do <laughs> it's it. It's on me to do it in my own <laughs> lab. Um, and so I think that's, you know, and, and technology is always advancing. So that's something that we can take advantage of. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's wonderful being an experimentalist and getting to actually sort of um, uh, kind of do things in the lab. The data sometimes just speak for themselves in a way that you don't have to argue whose idea it was. Um, if you right. did the experiment, you did the experiment. So. And did you start off wanting to be an experimentalist or did that come to you at some point? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think uh, if I s sort of think back to being a, a you know freshman in college, um, I was interested in um, I actually loved kind of abstract math courses where, you know, I stayed up all night yep. trying to prove something, right, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I certainly have had that theoretical bent um, and also enjoyed, you know, physics and chemistry. And I think that for me, um, I wanted to go into a field of physics what, once I realized it was physics I wanted to do where I could maybe think about some interesting ideas, but not have my whole job be to think. Okay. Um, yeah. And so what I love about my job is um, there's sort of the, the hands-on part. Um, these days, it's more the graduate students and postdocs doing the hand-on uh, hands yes. part. But there's, <laughs> there's sort of a varied aspect to it. We get to do a little bit of theory on the side, but the whole job isn't to think. And you're doing experiments in the realm of quantum mechanics, which is great because, you know, I've talked about quantum mechanics on the podcast before. Most listeners know that this is one of my things. But uh, I would love to hear, you know, how you explain quantum mechanics to the person on the street. Uh, I, I want to say as an experimentalist, but just explain it however you would explain it. I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not we think about it differently. Yeah. So to me, kind of the most um, kind of remarkable and revolutionary aspect of quantum mechanics is the concept that information Mm -hmm. is not something that has to exist locally. Mm -hmm. So classically, when you think about information in your computer, um, you know, it's stored in individual bits that are ones or zeros. Um, and in quantum mechanics, first of all, we can have the concept of superposition, where a quantum bit is not just a zero or one, but it can be in, um, in a state where until you measure it, uh, it's somehow undecided what state it's in, and there's some randomness potentially in the measurement outcome. So that, that randomness is part of what's special about quantum mechanics. Um, I, I sometimes like to use the analogy of a coin toss. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we do that measurement, it's like tossing a coin that could land heads or tails. Um, but the cool thing about quantum mechanics um, is also that there can be correlations in the randomness. So I can be tossing a coin here and you can toss a coin there. And we could arrange a situation where um, every time I get heads, you also get heads. And every time I get tails, you get tails. And that would never happen with an actual coin cost, but coin cost, but that could happen with measurements on a pair of qubits or quantum bits. Um, and that tells us that kind of there's some information that isn't y your information. It's, where are you? Pasadena? Right it's now I'm in Pasadena. Boston, actually. So You're in Boston. Okay, yeah. so it's, <laughs> it's not in Boston. <laughs> it's not in Palo Alto, right? Because everything I'm measuring looks completely random. But when we actually um, compare notes, we realize there's some information there. So there's this sort of information hidden in correlations. Um, and that that phenomenon known as entanglement is what's really special about quantum mechanics. And I, I find that kind of amazing that information can exist in this delocalized fashion. Yeah, I, I think that is exactly right. So let me run by you something that has been on my mind because I actually am beginning to write a textbook, undergraduate level textbook on quantum mechanics. I'm reading other people's textbooks and I'm struck by how little they talk about entanglement. You know, they just solve right. the Schrodinger equation over and over again. And the fact that there is entanglement is mentioned, but then it's breezed right on by. I mean, uh, it, it, am, I, am I right that the modern frontier of experimental quantum mechanics as well as theoretical is very entanglement centric? Absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned um, writing a textbook. I, I um, haven't written books, but I teach a course for freshmen on quantum mechanics. Oh, wow. Um, quant on quantum information. And that's actually part of what I have found amazing in teaching this course is that you can sort of start talking about entanglement from day one um, um, and, and certainly really start to get an understanding of its implications in a couple of weeks. And actually, at week seven, we get to the Schrodinger equation. Um, <laughs> um, but it, we sort of flip yeah. it around, and it lets you get to some of the kind of really cutting edge aspects of, of, of what's special about quantum mechanics. Um, yeah, super. it makes perfect yeah. sense to me. Um, so yeah, I'm going to try to revolutionize the teaching of undergrad quantum mechanics by putting entanglement front and center a, a lot quicker. But awesome. um, and the, but this, I, I need to ask now, do you have strong feelings about the interpretation or foundations of quantum mechanics? <laughs> 
You know, I think that that is, it's like, a, it's a fascinating topic. It's great for sort of, you know, after dinner conversations. And <laughs> <laughs> if you get a bunch of physicists around the table, everyone will have um, heated, you know, arguments. Um, for me, it's sort of, um, you know, at the end of the day, so far, um, you know, there is a theory that predicts very well everything we do in the lab. Sometimes what we do in the lab doesn't match the theory, but then it's usually <laughs> yeah, <sadly. laughs> something that we didn't do what we thought we did, and we need to track down some source of experimental error. Um, and and so certain aspects, you know, the um, things like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, this idea that you can't know where something is and how fast it's moving at the same time. Um, when you do experiments that deal directly with quantum uncertainty, you really develop an intuition for kind of where it comes from and what are the mechanisms that enforce that principle. Um, and so I think that there are lots of things that are sort of mysterious about quantum mechanics and one uh -huh. should stop and be bothered about it and think about interpretations. Um, but it's not something I have... Um, strong feelings about there might be some interpretations that i would take issue with but yeah well next um, time we're at the same conference uh we'll have yeah. dinner together we can talk about the interpretations of quantum mechanics i can give you a pitch for that yeah. um uh but then you mentioned the idea of measurement right and of you know that that i guess the three big ideas that, that you mentioned all of which i agree with that come in when you start talking about quantum mechanics uh, superposition, measurement, and entanglement, right? So is there a simple explanation for why we don't observe all this weird quantumness in our everyday life? You did the coin flip example, but then you were quick to say, not with real coins, of course, with qubits. So why not? Right. If, if the real world is quantum mechanical, why don't we observe all these things? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think a good example is perhaps the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that I mentioned, um, right? So there's a fundamental limit on how well you can know where a thing is and how fast it's moving, its position and its momentum. Um, but for sort of um, macroscopic objects that we encounter in our everyday lives, those uncertainties are tiny compared to, sure. um, you know, kind of <laughs> what we can see with our eye um, compared to motion that has to do with that object is at some finite temperature. Um, so usually in sort of our day-to-day our -day lives, we're not observing things at the scale where you would see these quantum phenomena. Um, and again, when you do experiments, you often really deal firsthand, um, or even try to plan experiments, you deal firsthand with sort of why it is hard to scale up these phenomena, um, like quantum superposition. Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, that's really yeah. what, I, what I was going to try to get at, because you gave a, a very sensible answer about the uh, using the uncertainty principle to why you know quantum uncertainties are there for individual particles, et cetera. But for an experimentalist like yourself, isn't much of your job trying to make quantum systems bigger and still be quantum? Yeah, yeah. And so you know one thing that I have, for example, thought about a fair amount, and I haven't um, done an experiment like this, but there's there's various groups doing experiments along these lines. Um, is how would you make um, what you might call a Schrodinger cat state? Yes. So a quantum superposition of a cat being alive and dead. Um, uh -huh. And okay, so we like to sort of simplify that down a little bit as physicists. So rather than a superposition of a cat being alive or dead, you could ask the question, can I make a superposition of a group of atoms, either all being in their ground states or all being in their excited states? And fundamentally, it's unknown. Um, which of those scenarios is, 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 is the one we're in until we do a measurement, right? right. Um, right. That actually turns out to be a, a state that is, is potentially very useful if you can make it. It's a resource for improving precision measurements of time. Um, so, you know, why is that hard to do? You need to um, somehow, first of all, manipulate this, you know, collection of many atoms. Um, uh, so actually, let me give an example. So you could imagine mm -hmm. maybe you can do this by having, um, I sometimes like to think of the ground state and the excited state as um, a spin that points down or a spin that points up. Good. Um, or equivalently, think, maybe a spin that points left and a spin that points right, but two opposite orientations. I mean, probably for a and, lot of people, the spin pointing up or down is is makes more sense intuitively yeah. to them than an excited state and non-excited state. Yeah, exactly. And so you could imagine maybe trying to do an experiment where... Um, you, I send some light that interacts with a group of atoms. Um, maybe I send, send a photon. If the photon um, is in one polarization state, it will rotate the spins one way. If it's in a different polarization state, it'll rotate the spins another way, for example. Um, and so um, 
uh, and then if I, uh, but, but in that type of a system, I could create something that's this superposition of the spins oriented in one direction or the other. And maybe I can just scale this up and do this with more and more spins or more and more atoms and make more and more macroscopic superposition states. Um, and then you sort of run into the problem that um, uh, the larger I try to make my system, the higher the probability that one atom does something it shouldn't do. <laughs> um, or you like don't want it to it, do. <laughs> it, 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 it decays from an excited state to the ground state, there, and there's a, a photon that leaves and hits, and in principle could be observed by somebody. Um, and that would give that observer information about the state of that one atom, and that would, so to speak, collapse the entire superposition state. So basically, the bigger you make the system, the harder it is to control what you don't know about it. Right. Uh, about it. And this idea of sort of superposition, it's all about having this um, uh, this kind of quantum system where there's something unknown about it until you perform the measurement. So there's that risk that you accidentally um, let some information leak to the environment um, that destroys that delicate superposition state. Um, and so that's something that when you plan an experiment, you can sort of immediately see why it gets hard. But but you just said that you uh, have contemplated this, but you haven't actually done this particular experiment, trying to put as many entangled um, particles no, together. No, no, in, in part because in part because it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there, are, you know, sort of the state of the art. There are a couple of physical systems where people have done things like this for let's around twenty um, spins, right? So that's oh, kind okay. of the state that, of the that, art. So you can go beyond ask. just a single um, spin in a, or qubit in a superposition of zero and one. Um, you can scale it up to about twenty, and I'm sure this will keep getting pushed. Um, uh, and well, this yeah, is what we that, we need to push for quantum computers, right? When you say exactly. twenty qubits, I mean that's a, a twenty qubit quantum computer. Is is we we haven't had anything more than that, I guess, is what you're saying. Um, yeah. So I mean, I guess you you know if you read the news, you know there are fifty-ish qubit quantum computers, um, depending you know what you define as a quantum computer. But um, yeah, um, so, yeah. So. And what exactly is the kind of system that you're working with? I mean, you gave us some some yeah. sort of kind of conceptual things, but what, mm -hmm. what what happens in your lab when you're pushing these Good. quantum systems around? Yeah, great. So so what do we do in my lab? Yeah. So first of all, um, uh, the general system I work with are systems of laser cooled atoms. Um, okay. And so um, perhaps it's a little counterintuitive, but we can use lasers to bring atoms to um, temperatures that are sort of in our lab millionths of a degree above absolute zero. I mean, maybe it's um, worth ex explaining a little bit about that. When I think of shooting a laser at something, it sounds like I'm going to heat it up, but you're somehow right. cooling it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so there's a trick we use, um, which basically relies on the Doppler effect. Um, okay. So, you know, I wish I could wave my arms and the listeners of the podcast can see it. <laughs> they, can, they can imagine. <laughs> but the basic picture you can have in mind um, is we have. Um, um, some atoms flying around, you know, they're at, initially at room temperature. And we have um, uh, laser beams, basically, that are um, counter-propagating. So if, if we want to s slow the atom down in a particular direction, we would have um, two laser beams that are pointing in opposite directions. And um, instead of tuning those laser beams so that they can resonantly be absorbed by the atoms, we tune them so that they're like a little bit too low in energy or too low in frequency to, to be on, on resonance with the atoms. Um, but there's a, this phenomenon of the Doppler effect. It's the same thing where, you know, if I'm sort of driving along the highway and a truck comes the other, other way, you know, the faster it's moving, the more its kind of frequency will be shifted upward, um, sound higher pitched. In the same way to the atom, depending which way it's moving, the sort of laser beam will seem like it's higher pitched or at a higher frequency. And this results in a phenomenon where the atom is more likely to absorb a laser beam uh -huh. that's propagating in a way that will kick it to slow it down than a laser beam that's propagating in the, in the other direction. Um, and so, so that basically means you get this preferential absorption of photons that slow down the atom, give them the momentum kick that slows down the atom. And then the photon, it's slowed down, and now it emits a photon. Um, and actually, that emitted photon then has a higher energy than the one that was absorbed, um, because because uh, the atom is now, uh, uh, if, if it's sitting still, it'll right. uh, yeah. If it's gone from sort of moving to sitting still, the energy it emits will be different. So that gives you a way to extract energy um, uh, from the atoms and um, sort of put it into the light field, and also the atom emits some photon in a random direction. Mm -hmm. So actually the entropy of the light field goes up. There's okay. some sort of disorder that's getting um, uh, pumped into the light field and, and the atoms can be more ordered than in and ultimately ah. sitting still. 
After hours of dedicated research, nothing feels better than the satisfaction of finally finding the information you've been looking for. You get that same incredible feeling when you're able to find the next great hire after a candidate search with Indeed. If you're hiring, you need Indeed. Indeed is a hiring partner that gets you what you really want, a short list of quality candidates as fast as possible. Because you can do it all, attract, interview, and hire at Indeed. You don't have to struggle on your own to find quality candidates. Indeed can help you hire the right people right now because Indeed partners with you on every step of the hiring process. You can find talent with the skills you need through tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. And there's no need to install anything extra. Indeed's virtual interviews work from your browser. So get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash Mindscape. Get a $75 credit at indeed.com slash Mindscape. Indeed.com slash Mindscape. Offer valid through December 31st. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. So just to make sure I get this, I'm a perfect podcast host for this because I actually don't know anything that you're talking about. I mean, I've heard colloquial on it before, okay. but I'm not an yeah. expert. So I'm learning here in real time. Mm -hmm. So the great thing about the procedure you just outlined is that it's not like you're trying to be Maxwell's demon and observing the velocity of all the, the atoms. You're, you're flooding them with light with the property that they will, if they're moving too fast in some direction, they will absorb a bit of light and slow down. And then they'll kick, then they'll kick out another photon and you'll, you're left with a very bunch of cold atoms. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what kind yeah. of atoms are we talking about? What element? Um, so in my labs, we work with either rubidium or cesium. Um, those are both in the first column of the periodic table. So they have one valence electron, which gives you sort of a relatively simple atomic structure mm. um, to electronic structure to work with. Um, they have sort of convenient laser frequencies that we can use to address okay. them. Um, yeah. So. And how many atoms are in a little group that you're working with at any one time? Yeah. So um, typically this, this starting point of, of, of laser cooling um, gives some cloud that could have, um, you know, could easily have 10, 10 million atoms in it, let's say. Um, but we don't, um, and, and then that's sort of just our fir the first stage of our experiments. Um, and then, um, you know, I have a couple of different labs that do different things, but for in, in actually, um, one of the things we've been doing is um, doing experiments where we have little clouds of atoms that are individually trapped and asking how much control can we get over the ways that these atoms um, can actually interact with each other. Right. Um, and sort of the, the general motivation is we talked earlier about entanglement. And in order to generate entanglement, one needs sort of some way for the atoms to interact. Um, now, ultimately, the sort of conceptually simplest thing um, one might want to do, and there are some um, labs that do this, is have sort of an individual atom um, trapped at the focus of a laser beam and have perhaps some array of those individual atoms so that um, you can kind of uh, con control, think of each one as a qubit, right? And, and, and form some kind of a quantum register. So they have um, every single atom pinned at one location. Yeah, exactly. Um, in things that I'm currently doing in my lab, we work with little clouds of atoms, each okay. one pinned in a focused laser beam. Um, and that for, for what we're doing right now happens to have some advantages. So that, but that's kind of what you can, you can picture is sort of um, a, a bunch of little clouds of atoms um, sitting in uh, kind of a, 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 a line um, trapped one next to the other. And then how many atoms are we left with or how many effective qubits? Oh, right. And so, we're, we, so each little cloud has um, a few thousand atoms um, and um, we can have, let's say, 20 of these little clouds. Okay. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And that, so are the individual clouds, uh, does it even make sense to ask this question? Are they like solid or uh, gas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, um, they're, they're a gas. Okay. Um, uh, you know, so, so the atoms within the individual clouds, um, you know, they can move, move around um, freely. They're to lowest order, not really interacting with each other. They're far apart. Right. Um, compared to the size of the atom. So they're sort of okay. um, at micron scale distances apart, right? Whereas the, the size of the atom is on, on the angstrom scale. And are they like sitting in a bowl or something? What prevents them from just falling to the floor? Yeah, and, and so that's, that's where lasers come in again. So, so much of what we do involves using lasers. So the first step I said was cooling them, but also then we hold them in place. We essentially kind of are levitating them um, or, or yeah. yeah, essentially trapping them um, by using the fact that um, the atom can basically um, experience an attractive force, 
um, um, uh, when it's uh, or, or a force that attracts it to the intensity maximum of the laser beam. Okay. Um, so this is you can kind of think of it as you have this oscillating electric field of the light, mm -hmm. um, which can polarize the atom, um, and so that allows the atom to to um, so so the light sort of induces some polarization in the atom that's along the field direction, and so it can lower its energy. Um, by being in the presence of that oscillating field, which is the, the light. Maybe one somewhat down-to-earth question here is, what does the lab look like? I think that most people like have an image of the Large Hadron Collider as a physics lab, and I yeah, think that uh, yeah. it's a different scale that you're working on here. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the typical scale, first of all, in terms of sort of the number of people um, who are um, operating such a, you know, a machine where we laser cool and trap the atoms and do our physics. It's typically, um, you know, three or a team of three or four people working together. <laughs> Very um, different. <laughs> and, you know, and they're in a room that's something like, uh, you know, 500 square feet okay. um, to give us kind of a sense of scale. Um, and so they will have, you can picture basically having several optical tables. So imagine a table that's um, something like five feet by nine feet or so, um, uh, that has on it, um, well, it, so in a typical lab, we might have one table that has a vacuum chamber where our experiments happen. So we need mm -hmm. the atoms, these atoms, these particular atoms we care about, let's say the rubidium atoms to be isolated in ultra high vacuum without anything else. You don't want them to bump into air molecules or whatever, perfect. right? Yeah. Um, and, um, so there's that vacuum chamber, all the pumps needed to create the vacuum, um, and then uh, various uh, lots and lots of kind of optical components, so laser beams that are used to do the cooling and the trapping and, and manipulating the atoms, um, which we usually prepare the, this laser light on another table, um, send it into optical fibers that carry it to where the experiments happen. So you kind of, you can adjust something at the laser end without needing to readjust everything um, um, at the vacuum chamber side. Okay. Um, and so there's, yeah, so there's sort of a couple of these tables with um, lasers on one, the vacuum system on the other, um, lots of electronic components, um, often kind of home built to do, do what we need to do. So every laser needs to be at exactly the right frequency and we're constantly measuring and feeding back to make sure it stays at the right frequency. So lots of um, feedback loops um, and, and things like that. So the, a lot, it sounds like a lot of the day-to-day -day work of one of your graduate students is tending the lasers. <laughs> well, um, that actually depends a lot on kind of the stage we're at in our research. So I would say uh, in sort of the early stages, you know, there's kind of a, really a custom built apparatus that the graduate students, they need to design and build and set up the lasers and get them all the light into the optical fibers and at the right frequencies. And then eventually, you know, the graduate students aren't, you know, pressing buttons to turn on and off the light. <laughs> that, that, that is all automated, right? So they're okay. writing computer code that tells all of the lasers, for example, what they need to do, and the magnetic fields and so forth. And so then the day to day life comes becomes more um, about writing that script that's telling the right. apparatus what to do, analyzing the data, which is, you know, some images, let's say, from a camera that tell us what we what the atoms are doing. Um, and yeah, and so that there's sort of a, a shift then to kind of sitting at a computer and making sure um, and, and telling the experiment what to do, analyzing data, and every so often perhaps going and fixing something on the <laughs> experiment table. <laughs> and the ultimate goal is we want to entangle these things. So what is it that is entangled? Is it is it individual atoms within a cloud that you're entangling with each other? Or are you entangling different clouds? Yeah, so one of the things we're currently very interested in is how one can have some uh, kind of like programmability of what the, the sort of graph is of, of entanglement that we can create. Mm. Um, and um, I will say that in, in my lab, we're actually currently working on, you know, can we actually quantify and prove that there's entanglement in our system? And that takes um, a fairly sophisticated set of measurements. Okay. Um, uh, that, that are in progress. Um, but what we've done so far is show that we have a high degree of control over basically the structure of interactions. And those interactions are the mechanism for generating entanglement. Um, and so what, what we are most interested in, well, yeah, and so both of these things are interesting, generating entanglement within a cloud, generating entanglement between the clouds. Okay. What you would care about depends a little bit on um, what application you have in mind. Um, and for us, there are a few different directions that we're intrigued by, which range from sort of preparing states that could have applications in precision measurement or in computation, um, 
or simulating phenomena from other areas of physics. And you know, one that I'm intrigued by is connections to gravity that you actually probably know more, much more about than We're I do. We're going to get there, believe me. I'm, <laughs> I'm, just, yeah, so, I'm just, And so know. again, so depending which of those things you want to do, you might want to entangle things in different ways. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm just luxuriating in all the you know vicarious yeah. uh, pleasures of being in the lab without actually doing any of the work. Um, so how does the entanglement come about? Do the atoms bump into each other or interact with each other? Or do you, does like some separate manipulation get them into an entangled state? Yeah, so um, one way, generically, one way to entangle atoms is actually to let them bump into each other. Um, and that is something that uh, is not the, the focus in our lab. And the reason that we're kind of interested in actually going beyond that and being able to um, let atoms interact that aren't directly bumping into each other is related to this idea I mentioned right at the outset that the special thing about quantum mechanics is that information doesn't have to be local. Mm -hmm that it can mm -hmm. be stored in these kind of non-local correlations. And if you want to kind of efficiently build up non-local correlations, then it would be great to be able to have kind of interactions that don't rely on things being right next to each other. Right. Um, and so one of the things that we do in our lab is actually use, um, again, use light. Um, so, so use photons to carry information between atoms that are far apart. So, you know, the, the atoms, again, are kind of angstrom scale objects, but we can have a photon convey information from one atom to another atom that's a millimeter away or from one little cloud to another cloud that's a millimeter away. Um, and so for us, that's a, that's a very long distance. Exactly, um, yeah. <laughs> on the scale of our experiments. Um, and, and so that's, uh, yeah, so that's one of the key approaches that we use in our lab. And you already alluded to this, but uh, could I get more details on this question of how do you know that things are entangled? Is it just you trust the rules of quantum mechanics? Because my impression yeah, is that entanglement great. itself is not measurable, at least in a single measurement. Maybe you could sort of do it over and over again. Yeah. And so in the experiment, you always need to basically prepare the same state many times um, and do a set of measurements um, that so that allows you to do kind of complementary measurements that give you um, uh, kind of more yeah more than one piece of information about the same state even though the measurement does uh, fundamentally change the state right so that's why we need to redo the same experiment and measure a different quantity. Okay. Um, one of the ways that we are actually um, currently working on is um, using some insight from kind of the field of precision measurement. Um, so so. There are known fundamental limits having to do with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. For if I have a collection of atoms that are unentangled, what is the best measurement that I can do? In our case, we're not looking at position or momentum, but you could ask, for example, what is the best measurement I can do of the strength of a magnetic field? Okay. Um, that makes these, you know, these spins that I think, think of these atoms as spins that makes these spins rotate. Um, and again, you know, this phenomenon of quantum superposition means that when we measure the state of an atom, it's kind of like a coin toss. There's some randomness. Um, and we know if we were to you know, flip 100 coins, on average, 50 would land heads and 50 would land tails, but there'd be some fluctuations around that. Right. And that just comes from the statistics of a binomial distribution. So, um, uh, And so those fluctuations scale roughly with you know, the number of so the square root of the number of coins you tossed, or in our case, the square root of the number of atoms that we did our measurement on. Um, so that sets a limit to how precisely you could you know, measure a magnetic field using the atoms. And if we can do better than that limit, uh -huh. then actually that is one way of, in a very sort of operatively useful way, um, saying there's, there's entanglement in the system. So that's the type of measurement that we're um, uh, currently kind of working on. It requires making sure all the technical noise is, <laughs> is sure. not a limitation and that you're really just seeing the quantum noise. Um, uh, yeah, and so far, so so far, we've seen kind of evidence that we have the right structure of interactions to give rise to entanglement, and we're working on showing, you know, is it really entanglement? And like you said, that requires sort of performing measurements of um, uh, uh, the sort of the spin in different directions. So right. if there's a full set of measurements one needs to do. So just to so. be clear to the people who are not quantum mechanics yeah. experts here, if I have an atom, a single one that may mm -hmm. or may not be entangled with other atoms. There is literally no measurement I could make on just that one atom that would tell me whether it was entangled. Is that right? Can, can you sorry? Can you repeat the question? One if more I time? have, if I focus in on one atom yeah. that mm -hmm. may or may not be entangled with others, ah, and I okay. think about measuring yeah. just that one atom, there's mm -hmm. no, nothing I can measure that would tell me whether there was entanglement with it elsewhere. That, that's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you got to be clever. This is what this is why you, you get paid the big bucks. Like, yeah. Again, if we had that <laughs> state we described before, um, the so-called bell state, where it's you know a superposition of both coins being heads and both coins being tails, if we just look at one of them, everything looks random, right? And, and we can't tell. Right. And that's that's generally true that I need to somehow look at both um, parts of the system. When you give the charity, how much impact will your donation actually have? This question can be hard, if not impossible, to know. Most charities can't tell you how your money will be used or how much good it will accomplish. You may know it will theoretically help a cause, but how, and more importantly, how much? If you want to help people living in poverty with evidence-based, high-impact charities, I recommend you check out GiveWell. GiveWell spends over 20,000 hours each year researching charitable organizations and only recommends a few of the highest impact, evidence-based charities they've found. Over 50,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $750 million. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save tens of thousands of lives and improve the lives of millions more. If you've never donated to GiveWell's recommended charities before, you can have your donation matched up to $250 before the end of the year or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org and pick Podcasts and enter Mindscape at checkout. Make sure they know that you heard about GiveWell from Mindscape to get your donation matched. And I got the impression from looking at your website, et cetera, that one of the things that you are specializing in is the fact that... Um, you know, it's relatively easy to get two atoms to be entangled if they're right next to each other. But you, you are be you are trying to be separating the sort of physical proximity of different atoms from their entanglements. So you can have different kinds of entanglement structures. I guess maybe explain yeah. what I mean when I just said that. Uh, what does it mean to have different kinds of entanglement structures? Can an atom yeah. be uh, entangled with many other things, or is it just one at a time? Oh yeah, that that's a great question. I mean, first of all, there is sort of a a rule called monogamy of entanglement, which says, <laughs> you know, if I can have two things that are kind of maximally entangled, um, or I can have many things that are all sort of weakly entangled. Right. Um, so, okay. so there are some trade-offs there. Um, one thing that, um, and, and uh, yeah, as you said, we'd like kind of control over the structures of entanglement. One thing I've worked on in the past is having sort of the opposite limit of two things which are strongly entangled, which is having many that are sort of collectively um, entangled. Right. Um, so if I have a cloud of atoms and every atom can talk to every other atom, um, that gives a way of making a, a certain type of kind of collective entangled state that does have applications actually in enhanced precision measurements. Um, and that um, is actually something I worked on in my, in my PhD thesis was using that type of kind of collective entanglement um, to make states that are useful for enhancing the precision of atomic clocks. And so did, that's kind of one simple limit is like everybody is 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 right. talking to each other and Shared. there's a collective form of entanglement all to all. Another limit is sort of maybe pairwise entanglement that you could get by having some nearest neighbor interaction. Um, and what we would love to do is kind of be able to explore between those two and really mm. control kind of the 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 structure of interactions and explore a wider range of quantum states. And did you ever expect when you started doing this kind of thing that you would be modeling quantum gravity? <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it uh, happened. Apparently, that is what is going on. I mean, uh, ha I'm not sure what the best way to approach this is. Uh, do we have to talk about ADS-CFT? Um, perhaps. Yeah. I, mean, I, I could say a little bit about how I got interested yeah, why don't we do that? in this topic. I think maybe that, yeah. So, um, you know, again, so my background had been in this area of kind of, you know, quantum metrology, um, um, I was building a lab where I have ways of letting atoms talk to each other with light that's a little bit you know, different from letting atoms collide with each other. Um, and somewhere along some time when we were kind of working on getting the lab set up, um, I had um, a conversation with a theorist named Brian Swingle, who at the time was a postdoc at Stanford. Um, and he you know, has a background in I guess everything from condensed matter physics to quantum gravity, um, right. and you know, so very complementary to mine. Um, but was interested in whether one can do experiments that would probe um, a phenomenon known as information scrambling, um, which is okay. sort of trying to get at what happens to information that falls into a black hole. Um, so sorry, and, just to again be yeah. clear, there. Um, 
is the phenomenon of information scrambling unique to black holes or is it a property that systems have including black holes and maybe maybe yeah. explain what it is <laughs> right yeah yeah so so um I, to the best of my understanding this sort of term was maybe first used in the context of, of thinking about black holes and asking um uh, about you know is information lost that falls into a black hole and I, I, our understanding is no it's not lost um, but it is very quickly scrambled which is to say it kind of um, gets uh, hidden in complex quant quantum correlations and entanglement and it's low something information that was initially locally encoded in one quantum bit yeah. um, would become quickly very delocalized um, uh, and there's a conjecture known as the fast scrambling conjecture that there's sort of a fundamental limit to how fast this can happen. Um, and that that would happen in um, essentially black holes, okay. um, or perhaps we should say systems that are. And now you mentioned this idea concept ADS-CFT uh -huh. um, in systems that are du that are dual to black holes under the framework of what's known as holographic duality. So. Um, I almost feel like I should let you explain this. <laughs> You're more of an expert. Let but, me say a couple uh, words about it, yeah, and then and yeah. then you can fill in for what re is relevant to what you think yeah. about it. So uh, yeah. we did have Netta Engelhart on the podcast uh, yeah. a few months ago, and, and she's an expert. So the idea that there, Juan Maldacena back in the 90s explained that there is a certain set of theories uh, quantum field theories without gravity. So things we think we understand pretty well uh, in n dimensions, where n is some number like four. Uh, and then there's also theories with gravity, superstring theories in particular, but maybe it's broader than that, uh, that have a certain background geometry, anti de Sitter space, right? So like a cosmology with a negative vacuum energy. And there's a relationship between these non-gravitational theories in n dimensions and these gravitational theories in n plus one dimensions. And the relationship is supposed to be they're the same theory. And it's not completely clear to me that it's true that they're the same theory, but they're certainly very, very similar in, uh, in, in relevant operational ways. So the idea is that we can learn about a real theory of quantum gravity in the context of this dual theory without gravity, where presumably we understand things better. How did I do? Right. Yeah. And, and so to, to me, what was intriguing about this idea, or one, there are actually a number of things that are intriguing about it, but one was this idea that in certain cases you could have on one side of the duality a strongly interacting quantum system mm -hmm. um, whose properties might seem like they should be hard to calculate. Um, and on the other side, there's kind of a, a way to actually visualize aspects of this, you know, in, in highly entangled quantum system in terms of curved space and gravity, that it might give us some kind of way, new ways of being able to think about strongly interacting quantum systems and have some ways of visualizing um, what generically you might worry is something that requires kind of an exponentially large description. Um, so that there's so so that was one thing that to me was kind of intriguing about hearing about this. So um, the, the the relevance to what you do is that you can imagine setting something up that resembles in some way the non gravitational side of the duality, but then if if dualities like this are real, in some other way of looking at it, you're doing a experiment that involves gravity. Exactly. Yeah. Or that yeah. mimics gravity, simulates gravity. I mean, you're not actually putting something heavy in your lab and feeling its gravitational force. Right. And that's also, a, you know, a, a fascinating direction of sure. research. Can one do precision <laughs> measurements in a regime where quantum mechanics and gravity both matter? But that's not what we're doing. That's right. Um, so um, we are kind of asking, can we build um, quantum systems in the lab where there is this idea of some kind of emergent extra dimension um, uh, that you know, has, has curvature that might right. be, that maybe we can think about as a gravitational system. Is that, um, you know, something that might apply to, to systems we can actually build? And then, um, you know, I, th I think that connects to broader questions. You know, bro there, are big, there are big questions about does gravity in our universe, is that actually something that emerges fundamentally from quantum mechanics? I don't feel equipped to answer that question. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but we can explore the concept and maybe it will help us actually think about um, have new ways of understanding quantum systems um, and, and entanglement. You know um, that when uh, Penzias and Wilson discovered the cosmic microwave background, their their famous paper just said, we measured some excess antenna temperature. I'm not going to say what it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> That's we'll okay. other people worry about they that. They won the Nobel Prize anyway. It still counts. Um, so in other words, let's see. Um, 
the 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 hope is that there are certain kinds of theories or kinds of physical situations you can set up where they have the properties that if all this fancy theorizing is correct there's a dual description that seems gravitational right and presumably these setups of entangled sets of qubits or atoms or whatever are not are not just lying around you have to work hard to create them <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. And that is what you're trying to do. Is that is that fair? Yeah. So I think um, we are. So let's see. Um, so we're trying to create as a starting point. One thing we've done is kind of build um, what I would say is kind of a toy model for okay. this idea of kind of an emergent geometry that describes something about the structure of the correlations in the quantum system. Um, and for me, sort of that um, starting from some, and this is something where, you know, based on things we wrote on paper, we had an idea of what we should expect to see in the experiment. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, um, seeing that feels like this, a starting point for thinking about how you can connect to these, um, these theoretical ideas. And then the hope, I think, ultimately is that one might build a system where one doesn't know um, sort of that there is this, this picture, some picture in terms of an emergent geometry, but one discovers it perhaps by measurements and it tells you something about the system, right? So that might be the longer term goal. Um, uh, yeah, so. So um, let, me, let me actually just dig into that a little bit. Um, the, with what you've done so far, mm -hmm. I guess the question is, are, we, are you learning things from the experiments right now? Or are you just checking that you're getting the answers you expected by doing the experiments so far? I would say that we are, um, first of all, kind of de developing a level of control right. um, okay. in the experiments to be able to. Be so, so just as an example, I mentioned um, sort of first hearing about some of these ideas of holographic duality in the context of the phenomenon of fast scrambling. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me there was that the models that people write down on paper um, that are supposed to behave in this way of exhibiting fast scrambling have rather exotic looking interactions that are not local, right? Right. Um, and that was one of the things that first made me think, well, maybe actually, you know, we do know how to realize not precisely those models, but systems with non-local interactions. Um, uh, you know, um, is that something where um, we might be able to explore that phenomenon or build other toy models that would be sort of hard to realize in, in other systems where you have, you know, nearest neighbor interactions on a lattice? So um, good. I mean, let's let's so, dig even, sorry, yeah. let's dig even closer there, yeah. because I think that probably a lot of people think of entanglement as an interaction, but it's not, mm -hmm. right? I right. mean, the, you have something different in mind when you say, uh, I mean, how do you make a long distance interaction in your world? Right. And so in our, in our experiments, um, what we, so essentially, I mean, interactions actually are always local, <laughs> but right. we can make things that look effectively like non-local interactions Good. by letting photons carry information very quickly at the speed of light, you know, <laughs> from, from one atom to another. Um, okay. And so effectively at the end of the day, what we have is what looks like the atoms interacting. We actually can kind of ignore the photons at the end of the day and say, it looks like these atoms interacted, even though they're a millimeter apart. Um, that's our mechanism for generating what I would call sort of effectively non-local interactions. And again, just for the people out there who uh, listen to this in similar podcasts, this has nothing to do with the spooky action at a distance that Einstein worried about, right? Because that's when you measure a spin and now you know the, the if it's entangled, you know the state of some other spin on Alpha Centauri or whatever. But you're actually just creating entanglement or manipulating entanglement between spins. You're not collapsing the wave function by doing some measurement on them. Exactly. So the, the first step is to ha is to generate these interactions, which can create entanglement. And then ultimately, if, to see whether you have entanglement, you do need to perform that measurement. Right. Um, and you would perform a set of measurements that do look like they're showing what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. Of course, we understand um, how, how it comes about. Um, and, and one key thing is that information um, did need to sort of travel from point A to point B right. to generate that entanglement. And so, I mean, maybe you said this, but it, it got lost. I mean, have you made quantum systems that exhibit this fast scrambling that they hypothesize for black holes? No, um, no not yet. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and so one of the things we had started to think about is sort of with the toolbox that we're building, um, what are some models that might exhibit this fast scrambling? Um, and we had, you know, I had a toy model that I'd been thinking about for a while, where instead of having, let's say, nearest neighbor interactions on a lattice, you have interactions at um, a distance of one site, two sites, four sites, eight sites, any power of two. Uh -huh. um, 
And that uh-huh. was actually somewhat different from, um, you know, models that are known to be holographically dual to black holes. Um, but it has this feature that actually in a sort of um, information can spread exponentially fast kind of from one point to any other point in the system. So the characteristic time scale for if you had local interactions for information to spread from one site across the entire system would scale linearly with the system size. Here it can scale as the logarithm of the system size. So that, you know, I had kind of this toy model and was um, had yeah. an idea of how we could actually do that in the lab. And then somewhere actually in the context of kind of thinking about this toy model, um, my, actually my graduate student at the time, um, Greg Benson, started kind of asking theorists whether there's like a more rigorous way to think about this model than my kind of hand waving. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, I can count how, yeah, my hand waving sort of arguments. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and through a rather serendipitous chain of events, um, Greg came into contact with Steve Gubser um, okay. uh, at Princeton, who, um, Rather remarkably, um, it, it turned out that this toy model we've been thinking about, um, if you tweak it a little bit, connects to a version of this ADS-CFT correspondence, so of holographic duality, um, that, that Steve formulated um, that is actually really kind of builds on some, some very deep ideas in number theory. Um, right. I can go deeper into that um, if, if it's of interest. Um, um, but that actually then led us to this idea of by tweaking that toy model, we actually could build something in the lab that has some sense of an emergent geometry um, that looks a little bit like anti de Sitter space. Okay, so let's just catch yeah. our breath here. Um, yeah. So uh, if we didn't know any better, if we were just dumb and naive and had a bunch of atoms on a lattice and we poked at one of those atoms uh, with a bit of information or something like that, we're being very hand wavy here. Uh, what you'd expect is the information would then spread out to the nearest neighbors of that atom and then their nearest neighbors. and their, So it'd spread out linearly over time. But right. what you want is, or what you what the conjecture is happens in gravity and black holes is faster than that. So you poke one atom and it spreads out all over the place and you're able to build toy models of that. That's right, yeah. And, and so we haven't really directly probed the scrambling, I would say. What we've done so far is show that we can build this graph of interactions. Right, um, okay. Yeah. And then, so, and then presumably where Goopser, et cetera, come in is that it's one thing to make these non-local interactions. It's another thing to make them of precisely the right form to look like gravity in some dual theory, right? That is, yeah, that's certainly true. That it's another thing to make them of the precise form to look like gravity in, in some dual theory. Um, and I mean, so far, kind of the toy model we've realized in the lab has um, there's, it has some parameter we can tune, and there's a particular point where it does have this feature of, um, the, uh, to the best of our understanding, actually, you can't quite really do the theory for a scalable number of, okay. of particles, but to the best <laughs> of our understanding, it could exhibit fast scrambling at uh-huh. some point, but that I'm not claiming that it's the holographic dual of a black hole. And then there's a different place you can tune it to where it has some features that bear a resemblance um, to uh, uh, a system where there is a kind of an emergent geometry okay. um, that looks like a curved space, but it's not actually a fast scrambler in that regime. So I, Okay, um, yeah. that's fine. Um, so what is the... Where do we make our money doing this? Are we are we saying that? I mean, at the end of the day, you have a bunch of atoms, and yeah. you don't really have gravity in in some mm-hmm. sense. Are we trying to learn things about systems that have some dual gravitational description, or is there is there a question that we don't know about those systems that you're going to answer experimentally? I think what I would like to understand better, and again, to to be honest, I would say lately we've been focused on building up. A toolbox. Yeah, um, sure, of course. And and for a while, I actually sort of stopped chatting with theorists because I, I thought <laughs> Too <laughs> you, know, you can always have, yes. have billions of ideas, but if you can't do the experiment, <laughs> then <laughs> where right. does that get you? Um, no, but but now I I think to me one question is um, if let's say we have we have this particular toy model where it does seem that there is a sense of what we might call a holographic bulk geometry. Uh-huh. Um, and is, is there some predictive power to that? So, and, and I don't have a sharp answer to this, but is there a sense where having this geometrical picture um, 
helps us predict something about the dynamics of the quantum system. I see. Um, okay. Helps us understand, you know, what's the most efficient way to um, transfer information from point A to point B in this collection of qubits, for example. Um, is, and I, I think that there are th things there where actually the gravity, this, this um, it's not precisely gravity, but this picture of this bulk geometry actually should give a useful way of thinking about the behavior of the quantum system. And I feel that having a toy model in the lab to play with that, and, and hopefully soon more than one model, right, um, um, is kind of a, a starting point. Um, so I, I guess I feel that there's always, there's value in doing experiments. It yeah. sort of, <laughs> oh, yeah. um, well, yeah. uh, uh, for me at least, clarifies things to really think, how do you do this in the lab? Um, just to give maybe also one example. So um, what you know, I think is fascinating theoretically is the idea that there is a direct connection between, we met, talked about entanglement earlier, mm -hmm. between a, a property called entanglement entropy, which is a measure of entanglement in the quantum system, and the geometry in this extra dimension. Um, so there, there's this idea that the amount of entanglement entropy in some region on the quantum system that lives on the boundary of this higher dimensional space is connected to uh, the area of, of sort of a, a particular surface in, 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 the, in the higher dimensional space, mm -hmm. in the bulk. Um, so that is something where that would be kind of cool to see an ex a system where you can directly you know, right. measure that in the lab. And there are some experiments where one can measure entanglement entropy. But also you can ask, does, do you need to measure that? Or at least as an experimentalist, you naturally say, well, are there simpler experimental observables that will kind of you know, get at some of the same um, physics? And in our experiment so far, entanglement entropy isn't something we can measure. Mm -hmm. um, and we were actually kind of surprised, even though we, when we'd been doing some theory before, we had made some plots of you know, what the entanglement entropy would do in a system like this. Um, and we were sort of surprised that actually by, by being forced to work with what we could, um, there were simpler observables that kind of actually showed some of the same physics, okay. right? Um, and so that type of thing, you don't really have to think about till you're confronted with it in the lab, um, but perhaps you can learn something from that. Yeah, so. no, I mean, I'm uh, entirely on board that experiments are just simply worth doing, right? I mean, you <laughs> yeah. can't just have theorists talking to each other all the time. But but just so I think I finally get some logic uh, mm -hmm. from your explanation that I hadn't gotten before. So let me play it back to you and you can tell me if I'm on the mm -hmm. right track. So you have the system of atoms with entanglement and you know, uh, you're know you poking at them with photons and whatever. And in principle, I could imagine taking a giant computer and solving for what the system is going to do using the Schrodinger equation. But in practice, that's just impractical. There's too many degrees of freedom, too many things going around. But if the specific arrangements of entanglement and interactions um, have this holographic dual, that is to say there's a way of thinking about them that looks like gravity in an extra dimension, it's not gravity in extra dimension. You know, there's, we know how many dimensions there are, et cetera. But you can use that knowledge to make a prediction for what's actually going to happen in your experiment. And then you can test yes. to see whether that comes true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that sort of um, the sort of fundamental challenge that we never really explicitly stated in our discussion about entanglement earlier is the fact that having a, you know, a full description of a quantum system that I could, let's say, put on my classical computer that description grows exponentially yeah. with the number of particles, <laughs> you know, and even for, you know, 50 some particles that just won't fit on the world's largest supercomputer, right? That's right. Um, yeah. And, I mean... and so that's where the question is sort of, under what circumstances is there a simpler description? Good. And in some cases, and, you know, there's lots of work on that by people who are pushing the state of the art in kind of numerical simulations of quantum systems. Um, and in some cases where it's a one-dimensional system and, you know, you have nearest neighbor interactions, it's kind of known how to more efficiently represent the classes of quantum states that you would naturally get from that in, um, in certain cases. But um, in more generic cases, um, uh, it's not obvious necessarily. Yeah. And the hope is that um, th there, this holographic duality could perhaps give um, a, an approach that lends itself to some, um, some quantum systems where currently we don't know how to efficiently right. um, describe them. And is it is it too much to ask that we might learn something about quantum gravity by doing this? Like, are you going to address questions about black hole information loss? So I don't think that I personally can solve those, okay. <laughs> those problems <laughs> because a lot of other people have thought about them much more deeply than I have. So, you know, so what can, can we contribute? Um, I think we can talk to the people who've thought more deeply, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, so... Uh, and and we can kind of 
again, build these model systems and see how they behave in regimes where you might not be able to calculate it. Yeah. Um, right. And that's and I would say, actually, right now, we're still working in the regime where we can calculate what happens well in our system. That has something to do with the fact that we work with little clouds of atoms that mm-hmm. you can think of a bit more semi-classically. Um, and so there's still, I mentioned a lot of this is about just developing the experimental tools. So there's a, a path to getting to systems that um, are more in a regime where it's, let's say, one qubit per site, and it has a simple theoretical description on paper, but nevertheless, it's hard to calculate um, right. what will happen, right? Um, and uh, so in that regime, um, the hope is that sort of by, with you know the right sort of dialogue um, um, between us and other experimentalists who can build systems in the lab um, and theorists who might know exactly what is the right question to ask, right, to learn something about um, information in black holes. That I, I think that that dialogue is essential. Yeah. Um, and part of it, so for example, but, you know, you mentioned before, um, if one can build a system that's a fast scrambler, that's not a sufficient condition for having the holographic dual of a black hole, um, <laughs> um, but it is a necessary condition. And then you can start, to, at least to the best of my understanding, um, and and so then you can start to ask, you know, give, you, you can explore. Can we build things that maybe it, it's not actually easy to calculate um, uh, what will happen, but you can measure it in the lab. And people are thinking about more and more refined tests for whether the system is or it might or might not have a gravity dual beyond just asking how fast is information scrambled. Um, yeah. And so I think there's a lot of kind of parallel work in terms of making experiments more capable and thinking about what are the right measurements to perform. I don't know if this is a fair question, but, you know, in the original work by Moldesena, the non-gravitational side of the duality was this very specific theory, right? Super Yang-Mills theory Mm -hmm. with a lot of supersymmetry, et cetera, et cetera. So should we be... So how confident are we that just from a bunch of rubidium atoms you can mimic uh, a system like that? Are we, are we confident that we have the right properties? Um, no, okay. <laughs> certainly not. But I, I, to me, one of the questions is like how um, generic are these ideas yeah. about Good. holographic duality? And I believe that theorists are often restricted to you know, thinking about models that they have the right tools to analyze. Right. Um, it would be great if the concepts generalize beyond those models. Yes. Okay. Right. Good. That, that's and a so, very good in what we can do on the experimental side is build systems that we might have some reason to believe are interesting. Like, oh, I, th- I think this sh- seems like it should be a fast scrambler. Maybe it's interesting. Right. Um, and uh, uh, and then learn something in regimes where you can't um, easily analyze it on paper. Yeah, no, I'm a big believer in doing the experiments and being surprised and then realize, oh, I should have thought of that all along, right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. And I guess uh, it's worth, before we before we end, I, I do want to come back to the fact that there are other reasons to do these experiments oh, other absolutely. than pretending yes. to make black holes or, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or yeah, whatever. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, you know what those reasons are better than I do, but one that you mentioned is pre- uh, precision timing measurements. Mm-hmm. So how yeah. does that work? Yeah, so... Um, Generally speaking, you know, one of the reasons that um, we love atoms is that atoms are our best measurements of time. Um, and, you know, the, set, the second is defined in terms of an oscillation frequency in the cesium atom. Um, and uh, one place, uh, where, and, and actually sort of the best clocks made of these laser-cooled atoms, um, really are at the point where um, one of the limitations on their performance is quantum uncertainty, that sort of coin toss noise that comes from the randomness of these acts of projecting an atom into one of two states. Um, So this is one place where um, entanglement can help you kind of introduce correlations that if one coin lands heads, another is more likely to land tails, so to speak. And so the fluctuations in that total count are reduced. I see. Um, and so that's um, a direction where entanglement um, certainly can, can help. And there's um, lots of work going on in terms of just um, um, taking some things that have already been kind of demonstrated and applying them towards the world's best clocks. Um, uh, one of the questions I'm kind of fundamentally interested in is um, it, the sort of simplest states one could make um, uh, and that, that have been made are so-called 
squeezed states that have that sort of collective entanglement. Every atom is entangled with every other in sort of an equal way. And those are certainly, it's well understood kind of why those are useful for those applications. But one of the questions I'm kind of interested in is if you can have um, richer structures of entanglement, does that also have a benefit for sensing? And in what um, cases does it have a benefit? And that might be um, that you're trying to get more information than just measuring one single quantity. Like um, it might be that you're trying to actually um, image a magnetic field or something. Okay. Um, you're trying to, right, you're trying to, uh, uh, or get information that's, uh, how is some signal varying as a function of time? What are the spatial correlations in the signal? So kind of, there's not that much, there, there's, I would say we're at an early stage of understanding kind of how richer structures of entanglement can offer benefits um, in uh, both sensing and timekeeping tasks. And so that's something where um, the more we kind of build up this, this toolbox, the more we can start to even explore at a fundamental level um, um, how to harness um, entanglement, um, uh, how to fully harness it as a resource for precision measurement. I'm sure there's very good answers to this question, but w why do we want to have even more precise measurements of time than we already have? Like, we're pretty good at it now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, one of the, um, you know, we talked earlier about sort of different ways of of probing gravity, actually, right? Or harnessing holographic duality. Um, but perhaps actually, um, can you really do measurements in the regime where quantum mechanics and gravity are both playing a role? Uh -huh. um, and the best atomic clocks are um, just extraordinarily um, uh, precise in, to the point where if you have just a very small change in the height of the clock, um, uh, I think by now probably on the millimeter scale, um, one can actually, uh, you know, that changes the rate at which the clock ticks because of gravitational redshift. Um, and so you can actually um, really sort of resolve that and see these, these um, effects of general relativity in um, the atomic clock, right? Uh, and um, in this case, and, you're talking about real honest to goodness gravity making apples fall from trees, not, uh, you know, dual gravity in your, exactly. in your theory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so that's, so I would actually say one of the sort of, um, motivations for better clocks is that actually you can do better and better precision tests of fundamental physics. There are ideas for using clocks to detect gravitational waves in mm -hmm. regimes where um, uh, sort of different parameter regimes from LIGO and things like that. So um, that's, that's kind of one direction. And it seems, maybe this is too naive on my part, but it seems from all the words you use that maybe quantum computing is an application for this kind of thing? Or do you learn anything yes, that is then yeah. relevant to quantum yeah. computing? Yeah, I mean, so so one of the things that um, we are interested in, so certainly generally entanglement is kind of the fundamental resource for quantum computing. So, yeah. you know, in a very general say sense, anything that advances, you know, what types of entangled states you can prepare might have some computing application. But at a more sort of direct level, you know, there's sort of the goal of building a universal error-corrected quantum computer. And then there's a kind of goal of asking, are there certain classes of computational problems that might naturally map to um, sort of existing or near-term hardware in the lab? Um, uh, and can we, can we sort of ask whether the, you know, the quantum systems that are natural for us to build can solve certain classes of problems? And so in that vein, there's a whole class of optimization problems Okay. that can be mapped to essentially minimizing the energy of an interacting spin system. Um, and generically, those problems, so these are things in the, in the vein of traveling salesman problem. They mm -hmm. can be you know, certain scheduling problems and things like that. Um, generically, those require some spins with non-local interactions. Um, and... Um, it turns out that, you know, so, so if you can, and to have a particular problem that you're solving, you need to be able to basically program the graph of those interactions. Um, and you'd like to also control, you know, the sign of the interaction. Do the spins want to align or anti-align and how strongly do they want to do that? So, sorry, um, when, when you say the graph of the interactions, we have some atoms that we know their locations. Mm -hmm. And then the graph of the interactions is given atom A and some other atom B, how strong is this interaction? Exactly. Yeah, and okay. also, it, what is the sign of it? Do they want For to align every or do they want to anti-align? Pair of atoms or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so having these programmable non-local interactions um, is a great way to start exploring: mm. Does this quantum system um, give you a way of efficiently solving um, 
th these certain classes of problems that are known to be hard classically. Okay. Um, and it's not, there are lots of, you know, there's lots of theoretical work on, you know, can quantum systems help with this or not? And there are certain cases where, um, you know, it's known that, that they, they won't help or certain approaches won't help and certain cases where it looks like the quantum systems can help. And then a huge wide open space where um, I, I really think you need to kind of play with the systems and, um, uh, and, and, and learn, right, from experiments. Um, and so we naturally now have a way of making these non-local interaction graphs. We see some evidence that we have a way of kind of naturally generating what look like low temperature states of this interacting spin model. Um, and we would love to go deeper into exploring for sort of, you know, the cases, the types of graphs that are hard classically, um, can our system find the ground state and so forth. So. And, and it seems to me as a quasi outsider that the field is, a, is advancing pretty darn rapidly. I mean, how, mm -hmm. how do you see what's the, what this field is like 20 years from now in terms of how many spins are being entangled and what kind of systems you're looking at? Yeah, um, you know, 20 years, I, I think it is really hard to predict because like you said, even just in the past few years, there have yeah. been quite rapid advances. Um, I, I would say, um, you know, one area where there's been in this field of cold atoms, a substa substantial progress in the past few years is the ability to really scalably create arrays of individually trapped atoms, um, where one can have, you know, an, an ordered array of, of hundreds of atoms that you can look at one by one and so pretty soon hopefully manipulate any one of them um, uh, individually. Um, there are ways of having kind of nearest neighbor interactions mm -hmm. um, that are um, explored in um, a number of labs, and it's actually also, also something we work on in a different setup than the one I was describing. Um, having kind of, so you can either have local interactions, or one thing that so far from that toolbox is kind of missing is having this longer range connectivity that could be really valuable in this context of efficiently um, implementing certain quantum algorithms or generating certain structures of entanglement. Um, and so to me, like for, this is maybe not an answer for the field as the whole, but one as a whole, but one thing I'm kind of excited about is can we kind of merge these, um, different right. technologies of the ability to have, um, uh, sort of more control over the graph of interactions with this really scalable single particle control. And is this um, the kind of thing where you could do it much, much better if you had a billion dollars or is it, is it just you <laughs> need time in, in the individual 500 square foot labs and eventually we'll get to the point where you need a lot more money? I would say you, I would say, um, for things I'm working on, I would say we need time in individual 500 square foot labs there and sort of the ingenuity of, you know, grad students and postdocs coming up with kind of, yeah, cl clever solutions and, um, uh, uh, and that's partly sort of, I think my taste is doing mm -hmm. some, some things that are a little bit, um, uh, it, you don't already know how to do it, right? If I knew how to do it and that just money would solve it, <laughs> you do something I would actually else. be less excited <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> than I am about things where I have a sense that there's something interesting to explore, but I don't really quite know what the answer is yet. Yeah. I think that's a, the perfect place to end. And you've convinced us all that we need to understand entanglement better, uh, theoretically and experimentally. So Monica Schleier-Smith, thanks very much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thanks so much again for the invitation.